So uh, I wanted to talk about uh, a story. It's going to be kind of a, a, a journey we're going to take today, starting with uh, and really focus on the work of, of one postdoc in the laboratory, Wei Wang. Um, and and basically, uh, I, I uh, got to know Wei because I contacted a tumor immunologist group in my institution and said, you know, we have this new virus model for papillomavirus infection in mice. And I'd love to be able to ask a single question. How, does, how do these viruses evade the immune system? Because... Of course, they have to evade the immune system to persist in us long enough to cause cancer. And as you dis, as you you uh, hear, uh, Wei uh, came into the lab and has 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 made that discovery, and then has gone on to uh, learn about implications on on human cancer immunotherapy. So. Um, I, I do have a disclosure. I usually never have disclosures, but I do have one because University of Wisconsin has submitted a patent relevant to some of the studies described in this talk. So I want to uh, acknowledge the people up front uh, because uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I uh, have a chance to, and I will refer to them throughout the, the talk as well. So Wei Wang at the top here, left hand corner, is the postdoc I just mentioned, and much of the work that she that that's being described in this talk is work that she's done uh, in the four 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 and a half years she's been in the laboratory. Uh, Dennis Lee, Megan Spurgeon, Ella Ward, and Taya Lazara, other members of the current lab who have contributed to uh, the work that I'm describing. Two former members uh, of the lab, Ayushi and Ellery Gronsky. Um, and then we have a number of collaborators, both at the University of Wisconsin, but also others uh, not at the University of Wisconsin, um, uh, including Pierre Kalum and uh, Ian Fraser, who have contributed to this work. Okay, I don't have to really use this slide, I'm sure you're all aware, because you've been inundated with this concept from uh, Lawrence's thousand <laughs> seminars that papillom, human papillome viruses cause approximately 5% of human cancers. Um, there are uh, epitheliotropic viruses that uh, their life cycle is tied to the differentiation of the stratified uh, epithelia they infect. And uh, Zurhausen many years ago uh, made the Nobel uh, prize-winning observation that in cervical cancer and later than in head and neck cancer and other anal genital cancers, you find a smoking gun, the presence of human papillomavirus DNA, often integrated into the, into the cancer cell, um, usually always expressing two viral genes, E6 and E7, which turn out to be cancer-causing genes. So the key, as I mentioned earlier, is for papillome viruses to cause cancer, they must persist. And to persist, they must evade the imposed immune immunity. And how do they do that? And to answer that question, you need to have an animal papilloma virus model to, to, uh, to answer that question. Uh, and why? Because human papilloma virus is a species, species specific. specific. And they need to, uh, and therefore you need to work with an animal papilloma virus that can infect a laboratory animal. And that was um, provided to us around 10 years ago, 12 years ago almost now, um, uh, in the context of the discovery of a papilloma virus that can infect laboratory mice. And this is the first papilloma virus discovered to infect the laboratory mice. Um, uh, 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 ever. And that was reported in 2011. And uh, this just shows the uh, organization of the mouse papillomavirus genome. The mouse papillomavirus is, is referred to as 
uh, mus musculus PV1, so MMU PV1. It has a pretty standard uh, genetic organization, circular double-stranded DNA containing the early genes um, that include genes involved in causing cancer, such as E67, E1, which is replication, E2, replication and transcription, E4 is uh, involved in some late stages of the life cycle, and then the two capsid proteins, uh, L1 and L2 for late one and late two genes. And this is just a picture of a wart caused by mouse papillomavirus, virus, where in red is the L1 capsid protein staining. So you can see that this virus causes florid warts that are expressing huge amounts of virus. And so um, this is a, a really affords us the opportunity to do a infection study because we can generate very large stocks of virus to then use for, for uh, subsequent studies. And over the um, years that we've been working with the virus, um, we have found that mouse papillomavirus virus causes the same cancers that human papillomaviruses cause. And they do so in immune competent mice, particularly the FEB strain of, um, of, of laboratory mice. These are immune competent inbred strain of mouse. Happens to be the strain that we did much of our prior studies uh, using transgenic, HPV-16 transgenic mice. And in this, so in the same strain, this mouse papillomavirus can cause cancers of the cervix, the anus, the head and neck, as well as the skin. Um, and so it really provides us the opportunity to study pathogenesis from the time of infection to persistence to progression to malignancy. And that's why this is for us been such a uh, compelling model. So first I'm going to um, uh, answer the questions, how do papillomaviruses evade host immunity to establish persistent infections that can then lead to cancer? Um, and it all got started when we did RNA-seq analysis on the warts from mice that were infected with this virus and compared that signature to uh, normal, normal skin, because these were warts arising on the ears. And shown on the left is a table that shows all the most highly uh, upregulated genes based on RNA-seq. And we noticed these uh, uh, subset of highly upregulated genes shown in gray, keratin 17, 6A, 6B, and 16 were some of the most upregulated genes. And they are form a class of keratins called stress keratins. They are keratins that are normally not expressed in, in say, normal skin. But if you wound the skin, now you get the induction of these keratins, which is why they were called stress keratins. And over here on the uh, left is just showing uh, immunofluorescence, showing that the protein level, we also see upregulation and expression of keratin-17 in the uh, mouse papillomavirus-induced earwort, whereas uh, it's uh, uh, very low in normal ears, not virally infected. So what's the relevance, if any, of this stress keratin-17 to human papillomaviruses. I sh what I was showing you, there was mouse papillomavirus. And what is the relevance to host immunity? Well, prior work from uh, Pierre Colum's lab, as well as Ian Fraser's lab, had shown that keratin-17 is uh, one of the genes that's upregulated in the skin of HPV-16 E7 transgenic mice. Okay, so just expressing HPV16E7 oncoprotein, you see this upregulation of keratin 17. Um, and Pierre Colum's lab had shown that K17 supports cervical car carcinogenesis 
in our HPV-16 transgenic mice, meaning that if you take the HPV-16 transgenic mice and place them onto a keratin-17 null genetic background, then the viral oncogenes no longer can induce cervical neoplasia. So that says that there's some importance of the upregulation of keratin-17 in, in neoplastic development. And furthermore, Pierre's lab found that loss of keratin-17 was associated with a skewed cytokine production in epithelial tissues, suggesting that there may be some tie to host immunity. So we wanted to ask, is K17 playing a role in immune evasion by papillomaviruses? And for this purpose, we asked Pierre for his K17 null mice, and we infected them with mouse papillomavirus to ask what is the consequence on a natural infection? Um, and the results are shown here. So start with the uh, top left, we're looking at the volume of papillomavir papillomas induced by mouse papillomavirus on the ears of either wild-type FEB mice, or in, in blue, or in red, K17 knockout FEB mice over, um, uh, this is weeks, sorry, this got um, blocked. And uh, what you see is in wild-type mice, um, and these are FEB mice, so these are immune competent mice. You see the um, growth of tumors over time. In the K17 knockout mice, you see the growth of tumors over the first four weeks, similar to or close to what you see with wild type, but then you see them start to shrink. In some cases, completely regress. In other cases, they just become very small, okay? So K17's, uh, the absence K17 led to this um, uh, reduction in the growth kinetics of the wart, rather dramatic. These are just some pictures. Here's an ear uh, infected, um, ear from a K17 knockout mouse that's infected with the, the virus. These are very small warts right there. Whereas here you see a florid wart on the ears of a wild type mouse. Here we're staining for CD8 cells because we wanted to ask if there might be an immune component to this. And in green is CD8 positive T cells. And you can see that there are many CD8 positive T cells in the warts uh, from the K17 knockout mice. Now this was taken and scored right here at four weeks, which is the time point where uh, you can still see these uh, warts visible. So you can easily isolate them and, and look at them. Now here is a wart at the same time point from a wild type mouse. And you can see there's a, a few, but very few uh, CD8 positive T cells in that wart. So a correlation. Is that important? Is the presence of T cells important? And so to answer that question, way um, depleted mice for uh, T cells. So TD or in, in the broken line uh, is the uh, uh, K17 knockout mice that were depleted for T cells and then infected with the mouse papillomavirus, and notice they grow warts just as good as wild type mice, whereas the isotype treated K17 knockout mice grow very poorly, um, just like you see down up here in, 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 in mice that were not treated with any antibody. So basically, this effect of K17 depletion in inducing the regression and slow growth was T cell dependent. Okay, so part one, K17 facilitates papillomavirus mediated immune evasion. So that was really exciting. And as I mentioned, there seem to be correlations with 
HPV 16, oncogene driven disease. So there clearly seems to be a relevance of HPV of K17 to the HPV 16, as well as to the mouse papillomavirus. And that was very exciting to us as well. Part two, is K17 important to human cancers? So um, what had been shown in, in prior work, published work, was that in a number of different solid tumors, human solid tumors, high K17 was associated with poor survival. And um, so we uh, already knew there was some implication of K17, though why that is that that is causing poor survival is not very well known. So Wei did the following. She went to the TCGA uh, database and looked at the head and neck cancers in, and she chose head and neck cancers because HPV causes head and neck cancer in a subset of humans that get head and neck cancer. And then there are head and neck cancers that are caused by other factors such as smoking and, 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 and alcohol abuse. And so we have multiple different etiological uh, uh, causes of this cancer. But one of them is HPV. And that's kind of why we decided, let's look at head and neck cancer. And she took the TCGA and she asked, is there a correlation between K17 and markers for T cells? Because remember, in her K17 knockout mice, the warts that a mouse papillomavirus induced uh, had a high presence of CD8 positive T cells. Um, so is that true in human head and neck cancers? And the answer was yes. So uh, red means high expression. We have keratin 17 over here at the top. CXCO9, that's a, that's a chemokine that's expressed from uh, macrophages and dendritic cells that attracts activated T cells into a tissue. So it's kind of a uh, indirect marker for T cell infiltration. Then you have CD8, uh, interferon gamma, granzyme B. These are markers for activated T cells. And so you can see that high K, those patient samples with high K17 had low expression of the markers for activated T cells. Conversely, those patient samples, cancers that had high markers for activated T cells had low expression of K17, an inverse correlation. And interestingly, that high expression of K17 um, was associated with poor survival versus low keratin 17 with high survival. And again, there was a, a correlation, inverse correlation with CD8. And what was really exciting to us was this the observation was true for not just HPV positive head and neck cancers, but also HPV negative head and neck cancers. So this was a, uh, a, a, a inverse correlation that was not unique to, um, to um, HPV positive head and neck cancers. Now in the head and neck cancer field, the Cancers that are hardest to treat are those that are HPV negative. HPV positive head and neck cancer patients have a much better prognosis. Um, uh, and these patients usually are treated by the same standard of care uh, 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 treatment. Though has been recently some clinical trials to see if they can, they can use alternative methods, uh, approaches. So because HPV negative head and neck cancers are the uh, cancers that are hardest to treat in humans, uh, we decided to now focus on the HPV negative head and neck cancer to see if we could uh, learn anything about whether K17 might be important in prognosis. And 
the main question we were asking is, does K17 status contribute to immune, immune evasion in head and neck cancer? Again, this is work by Wei Wang, and this is published in a, in a more recent paper. Um, now, the model system here was to use a syngeneic mouse head and neck cancer cell line called Mach 2. Um, it was uh, induced uh, by treating uh, C57 black 6 mice, that's an immune competent strain of mouse, with DNBA and TPA to induce oral cancers. Once those cancers arose, they uh, you know, uh, generated cell lines. Uh, they showed that they could put those cells back into the C57 black 6 mice and get tumors. This particular um, uh, cell line, Mach 2, they derived different cell lines from different tumors, but this particular one was found to be immunologically code and resistant to immune checkpoint blockade immunotherapy. And what we uh, discovered is that, yes, it expresses K17. And so to ask the question, is K17 important? We uh, took the parental Mach 2 tumors and subjected them to uh, CRISPR-Cas9 knockout to knock out K17 to derive a derivative cell called K17 knockout Mach 2. And when we asked uh, what are the growth kinetics of the tumors, when we implant the um, uh, either the parental or the K17 knockout Mach 2 cells into the flank of lac 6 mice and monitor tumor volume, here is the growth of the parental Mach 2. Um, it's actually pretty fast growing. And here is the growth curves of three different independent K17 knockout uh, Mach 2 uh, uh, cell lines. These different uh, uh, knockouts were actually targeting different exons in, in K17. When we took those tumors and we asked, um, and these were at relatively early time points, and asked uh, what is the presence percent of CD8 positive T cells, we can see that in the Mach 2, oops, the Mach 2, K17 knockout Mach 2 tumors, there's a higher percent of live CD8 positive T cells compared to the parental Mach 2 tumors. And if we took the K17 Mach 2 tumors uh, cells and implanted them into mice and then depleted those mice for T cells, now they re regain the ability to grow fast. So similar to what we saw with the mouse papilloma virus, we're seeing a, um, uh, a T cell mediated suppression of uh, growth. So what is the influence of K17 status, tumor status on the immune microenvironment? For this, we did single cell RNA-seq on the CD45 positive immune infiltrates from either uh, tumors uh, arising from injection with K17 knockout, knockout Mach 2 uh, uh, cells or parental Mach 2 cells. And we uh, identified different types of immune cells. And what was striking was that the K17 status led to pleiotropic changes to the tumor micro immune microenvironment, including so red is the uh, represents the uh, cells in the uh, K17 knockout Mach 2 tumors. Blue are the cells in the parental Mach 2 tumors. And you can see in the K17 knockout Mach 2 tumors, you see in a, a very higher, a higher abundance of CD4, CD8, positive T cells, 
uh, macrophages and dendritic cells and NK cells. Uh, conversely, in the parental cell tumors, you see a higher abundance of neutrophils and mast cells. So ple pleiotropic changes. <clears throat> We were interested in uh, myeloid cells in part because in our studies of the mouse papillomavirus virus infection model, one of the uh, cell types that we found to be induced in the war survives in the K17 null mice were macrophages, certain types of macrophages that are known to recruit T cells, particularly those that are expressing CXL9. And so looking at subset analyses of the myeloid compartment revealed a switch to anti-tumor macrophages in the K17 knockout MOC2 tumors. And I'll just point out uh, the one in particular uh, mentioned before, the macrophages expressing CXCO9, which are increased in the uh, K17 knockout MOC2 tumors compared to the parental MOC2 tumors. Um, there is also another uh, dendritic cell population, which is uh, increased in the in the uh, K17 knockout MOC2 tumors. Well, that those are all signatures that one might consider would be indicative of increased response to immune checkpoint blockade. For instance, CXCO9 positive macrophages have been shown to be a uh, predictor of increased response to immune checkpoint blockade in melanoma patients. So we wanted to ask the question, does this change in immune microenvironment alter response to immune checkpoint blockade immunotherapy or ICI? And the answer is yes. So loss of keratin 17 makes MOC2 head and neck cancers tumors uh, that are naturally resistant to ICI, now responsive to ICI. So what do I mean by that? Well, over here is mock, parental MOC2 tumors. And here is the isotype control, the growth of these parental MOC2 tumors. And here is their growth when treated with combination of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 they are resistant to immune checkpoint blockade. Here's the K17 knockout Mach 2 tumors. Isotype, you see they grow, they grow slower than the parental as consistent with the earlier study I showed you, but they do grow over time. Um, here are the ones uh, treated with anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. Um, and obviously they respond very well to immune checkpoint blockade. Well, that's mouse, but what's happening in humans? And so is EK17 a predictor of response to immunotherapy in human cancers? Well, we have a head and neck cancer score at University of Wisconsin. That's a big grant that helps us test new trials for, you know, uh, treating cancer patients. And this particular cancer that we have a score for is head and neck cancer. So there's been a lot of immunotherapy uh, trials going on at UW and including head and neck. And so we had a cohort of patients that had been treated when, with Pembro, Pembro, one of these checkpoint immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so we took those and um, uh, a set of uh, pathologists did K17 immunohistochemistry and blindly scored them for K17 high. Here's an example versus K17 low. Uh, and then asked, is there a correlation with progression of disease versus control of disease? And notice in the K17 high, subset, um, uh, all of them progressed. In the K17 low, 
that's where you found the ones there you have control of disease. And um, there was a significant uh, difference in uh, progression-free survival and overall survival among the K17 low versus K17 high, K17 high versus low. Uh, so this suggested that we have a predictor, which is uh, actually, uh, we've now validated in the second cohort uh, of, of, um, of patients uh, from um, a, a larger cohort from UW, but also a, a cohort from, from Yale University. And that work is about to be submitted. So part two, a mechanism used by pa pa papillomavirus to evade host immunity is also used by human cancers to evade, evade host immunity and resist ICI treatment. So, you know, you think back to tumor viruses and how important they've been in, in cancer research and how, um, you know, it was through the study of human DNA tumor viruses that we discovered tumor suppressors like P53 and RB in their robes. It was through the study of RNA viruses that we discovered oncogenes. So viruses have been pretty in, in important um, uh, tools in understanding cancer. And so it's 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 exciting to me that that uh, now there it seems like they're telling us something about um, how human cancers evade host immunity as well. Okay, so that was from virus to you to men, yeah, virus to women, virus to men and women. Excuse me. Now I'm going to go back to the most papillomavirus virus and end with a, another story that uh, touches on immune. Um, host immunity. And uh, again, a study done primarily by Wei Wang, but also with uh, Megan Spurgeon. So we wanted to ask the question, what else contributes to immune evasion in papillomavirus induced disease? And um, so we and others had identified estrogen as a cofactor in cervical cancer using HPV-16 transgenic mice. This is work that was actually started by Jeff Arbeit and Doug Hanahan at UCSF using uh, a model, HPV-16 transgenic model that they had developed. And uh, then we were we extended those studies using our models and and uh, determined that um, uh, this ability of estrogen to act as a cofactor, meaning when you take HPV-16 transgenic mice and you treat them with estrogen, uh, slow release tablets that basically induce continuous estrus. Uh, after six months, those animals treated with estrogen develop cancers. Uh, those treated no, with no estrogen did not develop cancers. This, uh, this was a, uh, the cancers depended on both HPV oncogenes and estrogen, okay? So there was a synergy. Um, and there's strong implication of estrogen in uh, HPV infections in, in women. So uh, estrogens and, and other hormones are elevated during pregnancy shown here. And that correlates with an alteration in immune cell repertoire. That's kind of reviewed in this, um, in this uh, study cited here. And importantly, the risk of HPV infections uh, of the cervical vaginal tract has increased significantly in pregnant women. Uh, also high parity, so high numbers of pregnancies and or use of contraceptives are associated with increased risk of HPV associated cervical disease. So there's, there's been this correlation, this, this known epidemiological correlation between estrogen and HPV infection. So we wanted to ask using the mouse papillomavirus model for papillomavirus infection and disease, does estrogen have an effect on mouse papillomavirus infection? And so the simple uh, approach was to take mice, infect them with 
mouse papillomavirus in their cervical vaginal tract, uh, and then treat or not treat with estrogen, monitor viral infection and neoplastic disease. So this kind of gives you a, a, a sense of how the um, uh, experiment designed. So you either have mice you've infected that are have no estrogen treatment or do have estrogen treatment, and we perform um, lavages to track the, the um, uh, viral load, basically, that's being produced in the cervical vaginal tract of the female mice over six months. Six months we harvest and do histopathology. So this is what you see at the end point. You see that uh, if you don't infect with virus, you see very low grade SYN1, basically, in the light color, or no disease. And here's an example. If you infect with mouse papillome virus, but do not treat with estrogen, you see significant disease. Um, high grade CIN primarily, and a few cancers. But if you take the mice that are infected and treat them with estrogen, you see a significant increase in the presence of cervical cancer. So some present evidence for uh, 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 additive or synergistic effect. What happens if we look very early on, let me go back to right here at this two week time point. So we just infected the mice and we put them on estrogen. If we take the lavages and quantitate the amount of viral copy numbers, this is a log scale now, you see there's approximately a 50 fold increase in viral load in the estrogen treated mice compared to the mice that were not estrogen treated. So estrogen increases viral load very early on in most papillomavirus. And it's important to note that viral load is a major predictor of persistent infection in, um, in, in, and disease in women. So that right there suggests that this, this might be contributing to the uh, effect of estrogen on disease in the uh, disease outcome. Now we monitored over that six month period. And what we found was that in the mice infected with mouse papillomavirus only, um, they developed um, persistent infections in, in seven out of 10 mice. In three out of 10, they actually uh, regressed and, and became disease free. The red line is the, uh, um, the mock infected uh, signal. So that tells you uh, baseline. Notice with the mouse papillomavirus plus estrogen, you have this persistently high level of, of viral load and no regression. And that's shown here at the end point. Um, those mice that were treated with estrogen all 45 samples that were looked at were positive for mouse papillomavirus, whereas um, uh, 11 of, of the samples in the mouse papillomavirus without estrogen actually were negative. Okay. What's est how is estrogen doing this? So Wei did analysis of um, um, PBMCs and by flow cytometry and found that in the um, uh, estrogen treated mice, you see a reduction in the number of whole blood cells, uh, T helper cells, NK cells, neutrophils, and monocytes, uh, all in all cases, significant reductions, also reduction in CD8 positive T cells not shown. Uh, in these graphs. So estrogen is having an effect on, on systemic immune, uh, immune state, leading to reduced levels of circulating immune cells. 
Remember, I told you that K17 seems to be a mechanism for virus evading the immune system. And if you uh, put virus on K17 knockout mice, now you see um, um, regression. And that's true. That was shown in the skin warts on the ears, but it's also true in the cervical vaginal tract, shown up here in the top right. Seven out of nine uh, mice uh, infected, K17 knockout mice infected with the virus cleared their infection, quite similar to what we saw on the skin. But if you treat with estrogen, you actually get a rebound and 100% of the mice uh, pers have persistent infections. So estrogen is overcoming the effect of K17. And that's shown here, the endpoint. Um, we looked at different, what was happening in the tumor microenvironment and the one um, big difference that we noticed was that in the, um, in the um, estrogen treated uh, le uh, mice, there was an increase in uh, neutrophils, both in the wild type FEV setting and also in the uh, K17 knockout setting. Um, and it's also correlated with disease severity, where four, uh, so basically four is cancer, zero is no disease, and one, two, and three are CINs. And so there was a correlation between the presence of neutrophils and disease progression. And if we depleted neutrophils from K17 knockout mice that have been treated with estrogen, we actually saw a um, increase in the um, uh, disease status, which was trending towards significant, um, giving evidence for anti-tumor neutrophils in the K17 no setting. So to end part three, the last part of, the, of my presentation, estrogen increases viral load, promotes viral persistence, and it exasperates mouse papillomavirus-associated disease in the female lower reproductive tract. It causes a systemic reduction in immune cells and accumulation of neutrophils in the mouse papillomavirus lesions. Um, it also estrogen re rescues persistence of mouse papillomavirus infection in the female reproductive tract of K17 null mice. And in the K17 null setting, there is an evidence for anti tumor neutrophils controlling disease severity. And uh, I'll just leave you with this model um, uh, suggesting the interplay between K17 and uh, pro-tumoral versus anti-tumoral uh, neutrophils, T cells, uh, and of course the virus. And um, here's a picture from this Christmas holiday season of my lab and lab significant others. This was uh, the going away party also from Yung Kyun, who is 15 years in my lab as a scientist, um, as well as going away party for two graduating grad students. So thank you.